the Justice Committee, and if you can do the needful with your mobile devices, that would be appreciated. With apologies from uh, Gemma Dolan, Emma Rogan, and Patsy uh, McGlone. And we've got uh, Rachel Woods and Paul Frew that are joining us through the teleconferencing uh, system. And if I could ask the clerk just to indicate those members that have delegated their vote um, uh, under the appropriate rules. For the record, Gemma Dolan and Emma Rogan have delegated their votes to the Deputy Chairperson, Linda Dillon. Okay, and I know those two members are, aren't here in order to facilitate the social distancing, so we appreciate that. On the, on the issue of, of people recording apologies, I would like the committee to be formally asking um, internally that there is a way that we record people that they're not deemed to have been absent um, because they're facilitating the measures that are in place, because I know some members um, are, are doing that to, to facilitate the meeting, and I don't want it to appear on their record whenever that's published every year, because people we know look at that and can make a judgment, but they're doing it on the basis of the social distancing. So if the committee's agreeable, I want that issue to be raised formally, that we find a mechanism uh, to uh, register those members that are delegating their vote uh, and are helping to facilitate the social distancing. If members are content, we'll, we'll pursue that issue. Great. Okay. <clears throat> um, the draft minutes of the meeting were held on the 9th of April. Uh, if members are content that they're a true reflection, um, that they would be recording, uh, recorded, that I could sign them, uh, please. My, my name wasn't in as an apology. I believe I put in an apology for that day. Okay. Well, we'll make an amendment in order to facilitate that, Gordon. And I know you were one of the ones that delegated your vote to facilitate social distancing. So again, I want this to be retrospectively applied um, for members that have been that have been doing that. Right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Gordon. Are the matters arising. Um, there's a few items. Just the minister has written indicating that. Minister for Welfare Delivery at the Department for Work and Pensions, in consultation with the Department for Communities, has brought forward regulations making provision for individuals in temporary release from prison due to the outbreak of COVID-19 in Northern Ireland to access means-tested benefits during that uh, period of release. The regulations came into effect on the 8th of April, and they'll be kept under review. Uh, but in any event, they will cease to have effect at the end of the period of eight months, beginning on and including the 13th of March. So that's just for noting members. Um, another item. Uh, at our meeting on the 2nd of April, uh, following oral evidence session on justed related provisions in the Health Protection Regulations, the Committee agreed to write to the Minister for Health requesting details of the mechanism to be used and the criteria and information that would be taken into account to, to uh, determine either the continuation or relaxation of the restrictions provided for by the regulations and the exit uh, strategy from the restrictions. The Minister for Health has responded, outlining that his department would carry out the review, drawing on the advice of the uh, Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Advisor, the progression of the outbreak in Northern Ireland, the modelling of future progression, and any available evidence of the effectiveness of the regulations in ensuring social distancing. And he intends to bring the conclusions and recommendations stemming from that review to the executive for decision, as it cuts across responsibilities of two or more ministers. Obviously, members, that letter predated uh, the uh, recommendation to continue with the regulations for a further three-week period. So the information is there uh, for uh, noting. Uh, obviously, I think it is important that we get more clarity around uh, what the criteria is going to be, and um, I will be suggesting at a later point that we invite the Minister for Justice to come. I am keen to hear from her, and uh, I want to pick this item up uh, later in uh, the meeting. Unless there are any other points of clarity members want from the Minister for Health. Yes, Linda? It is a separate issue, but it is just when you raise that you would be keen to hear from the Minister. I I mean, we spoke to the minister on a, on a Zoom meeting, and one of the issues that she actually raised with us was the lack of statements. And I think there's been a lack of statements from this department, to be fair. Yeah. Um, over the last number of weeks, I don't think that there has been really anything coming forward, and that's an issue where we don't have the opportunity to put questions into ministers. So, I just I would like to see more statements or, or more contact in whatever way that be, whether the Minister comes through you know, um, conference call or whatever way it is done, but I do think that it is important that we get an opportunity in some form to put questions to the Minister around some issues that are coming up, because some of the 
correspondence that we're putting in, the responses coming back are not, mm. not, not, I don't think that they answer a lot of the questions and I think we just need an opportunity to have a direct contact and, and an opportunity to question the Minister on some of the issues that are coming up. Yeah. I wouldn't disagree with that. I'm, I'm happy to have the discussion now, um, seeing as we've started it. I know, Rachel, you, you have raised this issue um, in terms of a, a desire to get more representation from the Minister as well, so I'm happy to bring you in at this point if you want to make a comment. Yes, thanks, Chair. Certainly, I would appreciate um, more of a regular correspondence and update, if possible, about what's going on and just um, the sort of open the lines of communication on issues that are being brought to us as constituency MLAs, but also as, as members of the Justice Committee, um, just to have that opportunity to do so. Um, and certainly just with the, the lack of, of avenues open to, to us to, to ask questions to ministers um, with the ad hoc committee and with the written questions, it would certainly be welcome uh, just to increase the avenues communication. Yeah. Okay, no, well, I, I concur, and I think as members we have um, relinquished our ability to submit written questions. Um, the Assembly has stopped oral questions being taken by ministers, and obviously the ad hoc committee was meant to be a vehicle where ministers would be bringing regular statements, and I note that this week there hasn't been a single minister bring forward a statement through that ad hoc committee approach, and I do think that we need to be getting the right proportionate response to, yes, minimising uh, the number of times that we're con in contact um, and also allowing departments to focus uh, on the uh, COVID-19 response. But as this moves forward, I think that we need to be striking the right proportionate approach um, and there needs to be more engagement on a wider spectrum of issues than solely around COVID-19. But even on COVID-19, I, I don't think that we're getting enough by way of uh, information, and there are some ministers who are regularly, um, and I, I take that as read that they are providing information, but there are others who haven't been providing as much uh, uh, information, and I, I would like to see the Minister for Justice coming forward, certainly to this committee, either a special meeting that we hold next week, and uh, I'll, I'll seek to facilitate that and put the request in and call it, or, or the Minister for Justice may want to actually make a full statement uh, to the Assembly through the ad hoc committee, uh, or may indeed want to do both. Um, and I would be making that a formal recommendation that we would uh, hold a special meeting next week, seek to facilitate that at the most appropriate time for the Minister for Justice to come and to answer questions, because there is public interest around how the police are putting into effect the regulations. And whilst there are operational issues that the police should be held to account on, ultimately there uh, interpreting regulations that were led by this department and the Department for Justice, mm -hmm. and I think the Minister needs to be held to account for that, <coughs> and also a wider discussion on what uh, the Minister for Justice's views are uh, when it comes to handling uh, this uh, COVID-19 going forward, and as I ask the Minister for Health for the exit strategy and criteria, um, I, also mm -hmm. want, I also want to know what the Minister for Justice's views are on a whole range of issues when it comes to this, because the executive are obviously handling this uh, in as best way possible collectively, but the Minister for Justice has a particular role in providing advice to that executive on a range of issues around the policing of it all, and I would be keen to hear from her. So if members are content, we'll formally ask for the Minister for Justice to come to a special meeting of this committee that we will seek to organise next week, and also recommend that she may wish to give a, a statement to the ad hoc committee. But um, in the first instance, our area of responsibility lies with this committee, and I would recommend that to members if you're content. Great, yeah. in, in advance of that, it would be useful if members want to provide um, the areas that they would wish to cover. Um, I know I have a, a, a range of areas, and it would be useful if we feed that through to the committee clerk, that this would be the, the areas that we would like to raise with the Minister for Justice. Doug? Yeah, Chair, I, I mean, I can't disagree with anything that's said here, and I think the more information we have uh, and the more information is put out in the public domain, I think it's the better. Uh, transparency is really good, and, and therefore I think we always need situation reports, because the reality is here things are changing on a daily and weekly basis. You know, we can get a brief this week on the Northern Ireland Prison Service, and next week it will have changed. Mm -hmm the police this week and next week it will have changed. So um, I, I really would like to see the Minister um, at the ad hoc committee's 
more, giving more briefings, uh, just to let us know how things are, are, are changing. And, and I think you're, you're right. If, if we bring her um, along here, if she's willing to come here, then, then we can ask her to do that. I, I certainly would like to get more information out into public domain so we just know how our different departments are now coping with where we are now, even the judiciary that we're talking about, talking about today, uh, how that's coping. I think all of these are really, really important. Okay. Yes, Chair, if I could come in there yes, Paul. on that, I would agree uh, with that and, and with the sentimentalities expressed at the minute. I have, we have an issue here locally, I'm sure it's right across Northern Ireland, where maybe the lack of local knowledge by police officers is having a contributing factor to disgruntlement, whereby people are being asked to shop in their own area where there is no shops in their local area, uh, and also people bringing hot food to loved ones. In a different population centre being turned round. Uh, I have also, uh, I think we need more information, uh, routine information on the prison population and how the system's coping and if there's any cases. And then also, I think the operational day to day stuff around probation board and youth services, all of that, I think how they are coping, I think we need to know and have sight of all of that. Yep. Okay, I agree with that. So we'll pull together a range of areas that we want to, to have the discussion, and we anticipate the minister facilitating that. I suppose it shouldn't always be us having to ask. I would expect a, a more proactive approach. Uh, initially, that was the case, um, but it hasn't been over the past number of weeks, um, and a lot of public debates being had. And we have a responsibility to scrutinise and to hold to account. And there needs to be that level of transparency that members have talked about, and that in itself will help to instil confidence. I think as people get a better understanding of uh, the type of issues that are informing the decision-making process. So we'll, we'll we'll move ahead and and seek to facilitate that, members. So thank you. Um, in terms of then another issue, just on response and supervised access arrangements, at our meeting on the 9th of April, the committee did discuss issues in relation to advice and guidance that currently provided, uh, currently provided for regarding supervised access arrangements, the need to ensure the safety of the child being paramount. We agreed to write to the Minister and ask for uh, the provision of clear guidance around uh, this issue, including the use of alternative online arrangements as a temporary solution where there is any concern about the safety of the child. The Minister has responded, outlining supervised contact as a matter for Departments of Finance and Health and variation of court orders as a matter for judiciary. Um, she has indicated that the Lord Chief Justice and the Social Care Board have issued guidance highlighting the need to maintain usual contact arrangement wherever possible and recommending the use of remote facilities where face-to-face -face contact isn't feasible. In regards to supervised contact, the Health and Social Care Boards advised this must uh, cease during the pandemic and social workers will liaise with families to facilitate indirect contact through written and online platforms. The Minister recognises that some parents may not be aware of the guidance and is engaging with the Department of Finance and Health on a means of highlighting it to them. So it's there for members by way of information, if you're content um, to note that, or we can follow up with any further clarification, but um, I think it's well laid out as the, the current position. Well, it was and, uh, myself and, and Rachel who had, had raised this issue, and I think maybe just if we can find out how... I mean, the Minister has said that obviously this hasn't, this information is not known by everybody out there, so I'd like to find out how that's going to be achieved, because yeah. this is a time of uncertainty for everybody, and everybody's in a state of high anxiety, and many of these families have other compl complications, so their tendencies to be in a state of high anxiety are even greater. So I just would like to know how that's going to be communicated to those families, You know whether that is the responsibility. And I know the Minister has said here it's, it's going to be up to the social workers individually, but families want to know from a high level what is the guidance, what what is being said, what's the best way to go. And I don't think we should be palming it off on the social workers either. Um, they should have some proper guidance which they can look to and say, okay, that's 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 the guidance we're being given, so we can follow it. And, and I just would have concerns about not giving clear guidance to those who have been left then with a responsibility to to try to make decisions around this kind of stuff without any cover. Yeah, well, listen, I'm, I'm happy that we ask that we are included in terms of the response around how this is going to be highlighted. We can put it as one of the issues for next week's meeting as well. Um, 
and you're right, I never like to see it's someone else's responsibility. It's one executive. People don't differentiate between particular silo approaches, so um, I, I don't like to see that whenever I get responses, albeit legally, I understand it, but that's not how the public view it. No, I'm sure I agree. That I would actually much prefer if, if we pa ask a minister something that the very least I think that minister could do is write to the, the relevant ministers and say that. I've written to the relevant ministers who will then come back to the committee because, as you say, they meet, they discuss issues, and I know in the grand scheme of things everything is that's going on, it's, it's very difficult, but every single issue has to be dealt with and dealt with properly, and, and they do regular meetings, so there's no reason why that couldn't be raised and, and passed on yeah. to, the, to the relevant ministers. Okay, well, we'll action that as discussed. Okay, then uh, another item just um, the department provided additional information following the oral evidence session on COVID 19 preparations and justice elements of the regulations. Um, it was received last night and emailed to members this morning. Copies have also been provided um, to members. The response covers evidence required by the executive office to trigger a direction against the business, how prosecutions relating to the restrictions will be dealt with during the pandemic, guidance available in relation to family proceedings and procurement, and availability of the personal protection equipment and any uh, plans for deployment of the army. So the information is there um, for members uh, to note. Um, Obviously, we can consider it um, in advance of next week's uh, scheduled meeting now that we'll facilitate. If there are issues that we can follow up with the Minister, then we can do that. Okay, um, let's move on, members, to the oral evidence session then that we're, we're going to hear. Um, this is to outline proposals for an interim payment scheme for legal aid suppliers. Um, given the significant impact that COVID-19 is having on legal services, marketplace and the results of a targeted five-day consultation that has been undertaken. The departmental briefing papers um, are in members' um, packs at pages 15 to 54. There's also a briefing paper that's been provided by the Bar Council on proposals for members. That's at pages 7 to 9 of your table pack. And I'm going to welcome uh, Eamon O'Connor and also Paul Andrews uh, to the meeting. Um, so you're both very welcome. Um, it will be recorded by Hansard and then that will be published in due course. So I'm going to hand over to yourselves and then we'll, I'm sure members will have some questions. Uh, thank you, Chair, for your welcome. Uh, I'm Paul Andrews, the Chief Executive of the Legal Services Agency. My distant colleague is uh, Eamon O'Connor, the uh, de Acting the Deputy Director for Enabling Access to Justice. And we welcome the opportunity to brief the committee on the pro uh, proposal for a COVID-19 interim payment scheme for legal aid suppliers. The uh, committee will be aware from the briefing note that given the challenging circumstances, a targeted consultation issued to the Law Society on Bar on the 10th of April. In normal circumstances, we would of course have brought the proposal to the committee's attention before issuing the paper. I want to ensure the committee that no discourtesy was intended by our approach in these very unusual <coughs> sets of circumstances. In fact, the importance of the proposal is evident from the agreement of all parties to an abridged consultation period of five working days, which closed on Tuesday, uh, the 21st of April. The Minister will, of course, wish to consider those responses and will in particular want to have the benefit of the views of the committee before <coughs> reaching a final decision on the proposal to introduce the scheme. I propose, uh, Chair, to uh, focus my introductory remarks on four issues, if I may. First, the need for an interim uh, payment scheme. Secondly, the universal scope of the proposal. Thirdly, the design principles behind the scheme. And fourthly, and very briefly, some preliminary views on the consultation responses. Then, with your agreement, Chair, I would uh, propose to invite Eamon to say some remarks on the, the drafting of the ministerial direction which would enable the scheme, as I think to hear both sets of comments may give a broader context to the committee. So, if I turn first to the need for uh, an interim payment scheme, Legal Aid in Northern Ireland uh, supports access to justice through a network of over 400 sister firms which operate across some 74 geographical locations. This is supported by over 600 barristers who undertake legal aid work. The department has a strategic interest in ensuring that there is not only a sustainable network of suppliers to provide 
advice and assistance and representation to individuals during the current crisis, but one which can emerge from the crisis to continue to facilitate access to justice. The proposal for an interim payment scheme is intended to support the strategic interest in maintaining a sustainable network of suppliers to deliver access to justice. Representative bodies have confirmed a significant change in the legal services landscape, with very few cases being disposed of by the courts and a downturn in privately paying work. Many suppliers undertake legal aid work, and some 200 firms of solicitors reported that they receive over 80% of their income from legal aid. In the current climate, the dependence on existing legal aid cases, cases as a guaranteed source of income will no doubt increase. Without a scheme, a sustained downturn in the legal services market could jeopardise the longer-term sustainability of an appropriate supplier base and ultimately access to justice. As the committee will note, the proposal seeks to reflect the spirit of the Procurement Guidance Note 0120, which has been adopted by the Executive in respect of supplier relief due to COVID-19 issues. When we turn to the universal scope of the scheme, the consultation uh, proposes a universal scheme for all suppliers holding an existing legal aid certificate for three months from the commencement of the scheme and on a rolling basis thereafter. This recognises the legal entitlement to payment which the certificate establishes and the dependence on legal aid as a source of income across the supplier network, irrespective of the size and scale of suppliers. The Department recognises that some suppliers have significant portfolios of legal aid cases and large overheads, while others, perhaps sole practitioners, have a small number of cases and corresponding lower overheads. However, the dependence on legal aid income can be as real for suppliers at both ends of the spectrum. The scheme also recognises that in significant areas of legal aid work, suppliers cannot receive remuneration until a case is completed. In the vast majority of criminal cases and all family cases in the lower courts, suppliers absorb the cost of work undertaken across months and on occasions years before seeking remuneration. The universal nature of the proposed scheme is intended to provide some cash flow for firms with existing cases which cannot be brought to a natural conclusion at this time. This approach also future proofs the support for the supplier base while restrictions remain in place and the current situation evolves. In addition, the proposal seeks to ensure that suppliers who have a modest number of cases are not disadvantaged from availing of any scheme due to the scale of their operations. We turn to the design principles behind the scheme. The proposed scheme has been designed around three broad principles. The first is to minimise risk to the public purse. This is sought to be achieved by establishing a qualifying period of three months so that there is already a legal entitlement to future payment and that work has already been undertaken. We have proposed making one payment per case and have proposed a fee structure which minimises the risk of overpayment. And that goes alongside existing recruitment procedures which are already in place. Second principle is simplicity not only to apply, but also to administer. If I may give a practical example, Chair, in the Magistrates Court criminal cases, there are broadly five categories of cases, and there are nine disposal types, all of which have separate fees. So other areas, I can assure you, are more complicated than that. But the proposal is to seek to establish a single fee for a solicitor and a single fee for a barrister, and that will aid considerably in the efficiency of administering any such scheme. We have also, as our third principle, built upon the existing fee structures and propose uh, interim fees which are based on those structures, sometimes as a percentage of the fees, and on other occasions the full fee where that is of a de minimis value. The proposed scheme has been designed to operate alongside uh, the uh, determination of substantive claims, as we will continue to do business as usual in as far as claims are available to us to assess. As such, the scheme will result in some cases only receiving a small amount of what will be payable when the case is concluded, but in our view this is an inevitable feature of having a low risk 
quick turnaround scheme. The proposed scheme does not seek to change what will be paid for a case when it is determined. It simply creates an early payment of a small portion of the fee which will be netted off when the final bill is received. Let's <coughs> make a comment about preliminary views from consultees. Uh, we have recently received consultation responses from the Law Society and Bar and a small number of individuals. Uh, we will provide a, a post-consultation report to the committee. Our, our initial uh, review of the responses suggests that while there is clearly a strong endorsement for the need of a scheme and for a universal scheme, there is a support for a simple scheme to apply and administer. I think the, the general response is that the level of fees that have been proposed are too low. Many of these are technical and detailed submissions which we will consider and we will provide advice to the Minister in the incoming days. Well, I would be more than happy to take questions now. I, I think, with your permission, Chair, it might be more helpful to allow Eamon to say something about the, the legal structure which will enable the scheme, if it is introduced, to be brought forward. Well, that makes sense. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Eamon. As Paul said, I will deal with the draft ministerial direction, and that is to be found at page 13 of the consultation documents. The Department may give directions to the Director of Legal Aid Casework pursuant to the powers arising from Section 3.1 of the Legal Aid and Coroner's Courts Act, Northern Ireland, 2014. The Director must comply with such directions given in respect of how the functions of the Legal Services Agency are to be exercised. The proposed direction is consistent with the existing statutory schemes for payment for both civil legal services and criminal legal aid services. The direction is of a general and strategic nature. The particular terms and conditions have been developed and set down in the interim payment scheme, which follows at pages 16 onwards. The Department may issue directions relevant to the determination of remuneration for legal services, and I am satisfied that the proposed direction which seeks to modify the modalities of payment to legal aid suppliers is intravaris. That is, it is permissible within powers available under existing legislation. <clears throat> the purpose of the direction is to authorise the director to introduce a scheme permitting interim payments of professional fees only to suppliers, meaning solicitors or barristers. The proposed direction contains certain constraints and limitations to any such scheme. Paragraph 1A states that payments can only be permitted where there is a full legal aid certificate in place. Paragraph 2 states that the scheme shall only extend to professional fees, not to such things as travel, expenses and any other outlays incurred. Paragraph 4 states that no application for an interim payment shall be accepted in respect of exceptional preparation claims in criminal proceedings or civil cases, for example, inquests which receive exceptional funding. Paragraph 5 states that no application for an interim payment shall be accepted if there has been a previous interim payment of professional fees for a particular case under the Legal Services Agency Special Payments Policy which is there to provide temporary financial assistance to suppliers deemed to be in severe financial hardship or other statutory interim payment provisions or the other departmental directions issued in 2017 which allow for interim payments for exceptional preparation in criminal cases or civil cases which have received exceptional funding or if there has been a previous application under the proposed interim payment scheme. Paragraph 7 states that the scheme shall make provision for recoupment of fees paid out at the earliest available opportunity. The scheme shall also allow for readjustments to claims that have been submitted for payment at the conclusion of a case to take account of any interim payment made. The scheme may also allow for the reimbursement of an interim payment from a supplier where they cease to trade or become insolvent. Chair, the above provisions are intended to ensure the protection of public funds. The scheme is not intended 
to be the subject of statutory appeals provisions set out in the remuneration legislation. Finally, there is a sunset clause to ensure the scheme has a certain end date. Direction states that the scheme shall expire three months after its commencement date, but may be extended with the agreement of both the Department of Justice and Finance for such periods as the Director considers necessary, but for a maximum of a further three months, which means in total six months. And during any extended period, the Director shall keep the operation of the scheme under review and may, subject to providing the prescribed notice, terminate the scheme during that extended period. Chair, we are both happy to take questions, as the members may have. Okay, well, can I thank you for outlining the scheme and the rationale behind it? Um, and obviously, it's at a very difficult time for um, those that are involved in providing legal services. Um, I suppose I have a couple of just broad questions first before I, I get into the specifics around the scheme. Um, those that are legal practitioners, I suppose, are facing the same kind of challenges that everybody's facing. Um, and w one of my questions is, what access have those um, involved in the profession got to the existing uh, schemes that have been announced in terms of furloughing staff and the kind of support packages that have been put together? There should have been solicitors' firms that have been able to access the £10,000 grants. Um, most of them would be in premises that would be within the threshold uh, to meet that criteria. So, my, my question, first of all, is: you know, Are those schemes that are universally available being accessed by the legal profession, or there are there those within the legal profession that, like others, are, are falling through the cracks? If, if I could take that uh, question, Chair, we have deliberately not made the scheme dependent on an individual having fully accessed those matters, because I think in <coughs> practical terms it's very difficult for someone to show at any point in time that they have done that, because they will have a number of cases which they can apply for. My understanding in speaking to the Law Society is that they have received representations from a number of firms saying that they are having difficulty mm. accessing the support uh, of the measures that have been announced. I have a detail of that, but that is the, the submissions that I have received from the Law Society, and I would have to say that the Law Society almost uh, twice or three times a week are sending out to their members notification of the various schemes that are available. I think the bar is slightly different because they are all self-employed, so therefore that scheme kicks in in June on the self-employment side, and the bar are raising issues that th there will be a number of their uh, members who will not be able to avail of that, some who would be junior members of the bar who wouldn't have the number of, of tax returns over the number of years that are required, some that may have been on uh, career breaks, uh, and some that may, for other reasons, just technically fall outside the threshold. So I think the spirit of the answer to your question is that people will be seeking to avail of them. But the, the message so far that we are receiving is that there has been some difficulty with uh, solicitor, solicitor firms, but I, I'm afraid I can't give you more detail on that at, at this point, Chair. I appreciate the, the issue around barristers being self-employed. Uh, and again, that's an issue that I've heard from everyone who's self-employed um, and, and also those that would have drawn down income through dividends for example, and that not being covered by the HMR scheme. So you know, what, what I'm trying to, to get at here is why is there particular need here when there will be others who will say, but I have the same problems and dilemmas that people in the legal profession are facing, and I think we need to be doing what we can to support everybody. But I do think it's important that whenever new schemes are being introduced, then that will create a consequence and a knock-on effect for others who will then say, well, there's a precedent, what about me? And this is where I want to make sure that the Department of Justice aren't acting in isolation of the broader ramifications of, of these type of schemes. But I recognise there are particular circumstances and particular aspects of departments that need to be addressed. So the, the self-employed aspect of this, 
um, are barristers not able to access the self-employed support scheme that HMRC has made provision for? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, they will be able to access the scheme for the self-employed in June, subject to meeting the criteria. I, I think, Chair, the approach that we have taken in developing the scheme is to look at the, the procurement guidance note, which talks about suppliers and people who are supplying services. Now, we, we tend to refer to the Law Society and Bar as suppliers of publicly funded legal services. So while there is not a contract in place for the solicitor to do that, it's done under a legal aid certificate. In our view, that creates a legal entitlement to payment. So what we're saying is we're trying to follow through the same principle that the executive had established for suppliers of goods and services. We're saying this is a legal service that is being provided. And that's the, that's the approach that we have taken to the development of the scheme. Chair, may I also add that I think, um, in contrast to other schemes, we are not paying out any new money here. This is simply an advanced payment scheme that the practitioners will be entitled to in due course. It simply draws the money forward earlier than has been the case previously. So we're not granted any money. There's no new money here. It's simply an advanced payment scheme. The, the documents indicate, though, there's a resource requirement of nearly a million pounds. So if this is coming out of existing funding, well, why is there a need being identified? The, the, that figure, uh, Chair, is in respect of if some practitioners, as uh, Eamon had suggested, uh, are unable to continue to practice, then that certificate will transfer to another supplier to continue to deliver the service. So if a supplier becomes bankrupt, uh, there will continue to be a legal entitlement to payment for the work that was actually done. But you will then have a second firm coming in to pick up the case. So the ring fencing is simply to look at what is the scenario of someone who may find themselves bankrupt. Uh, we had done some modelling which suggested that in the greater scheme of things, if 10% if of suppliers failed, you would have perhaps a maximum exposure of £750,000. I, I would have to point out that that's actually just a bold estimate because in our view, the vast majority of suppliers, if they were to fail, would still be entitled to the fees that we have paid out. They may actually be entitled to an additional fee because they have done more work up to the point of going bankrupt than uh, the interim fee uh, covered. Uh, that's an important factor in how we set those fees. So that is a contingent fee that has been identified should uh, there be a significant volume of suppliers who fail during the current economic crisis. And just on the, the level of fee then, how, how has that uh, figure been reached um, in terms of the appropriateness of that? So if I go back to the, the example that I, I gave of the magistrate's court fees where you have uh, an array of different scenarios, uh, what we did in the magistrate's court fee, and I'm referring to page 21 of the consultation document for your ease of reference, um, the magistrate's court fees, there are nine categories, and for a solicitor, the lowest category is £265 or something like that. So what we did was we took the lowest possible fee and have suggested approximately half of that at £137.50. In reality, there will be cases which would have a higher standard fee, mm -hmm. but what we adopted was an approach of going to that lowest fee because that is the minimum that anyone will get. And we have reduced that by 50% because if somebody passes it on uh, as a case, that's what they would get in those circumstances. Now, as you will appreciate, practitioners will argue that those fees are too low, and we will listen and uh, consider the representations that we have received. But if I go back to my other point, Chair, uh, there are usually in the region of about 20,000 criminal legal aid certificates in the magistrate's court in a year that we get. I, to be quite honest, don't have the capacity to resource a scheme to pay out with multiple levels of fees within it. It increases the risk of an overpayment. 
uh, it increases the risk of a recoupment having to be made at a difficult time in the future for practitioners. So a one fee is easy to administer. We can do it with accuracy and with speed and get the money to the practitioners. And the same approach basically has been adopted. Uh, and just to give a, an additional example, uh, it, for barristers, we are suggesting one fee for the barrister, no matter what type of barrister it is, because in theory, in, the, in criminal matters, you could have four types of barristers. You know, so we, we just want to make this simple, crisp. We, we may have received some representations about that, but we will consider those uh, in, in the next day or so. Um, and if you, you proceed with the, the level of fee currently suggested, I'm not disagreeing with the, the rationale that you've argued, by the way. Um, will there be any retrospective looking at that when we emerge on the other side to yes, say, absolutely. you know, this was the emergency fee, um, but having now proceeded through that, we can now look back and if there's a necessity to top that up. Is that something that's open? That, that, that is exactly what will happen, because if, if I take that example where someone has been paid £137.50, when that case is disposed, if that case is actually disposed at a proper fee of £272 or whatever, what we will do is pay the 272 and recoup the 137 So effectively, it is the top-up fee which they will get at the close of the case. One other point perhaps I could make, we have retained with a slight modification the special payments uh, policy. This is a, a measure of last resort if a practitioner is facing extreme financial hardship. Sometimes that's to do with the fact that they've got a small number of cases which have run on for a long period of time and you, their income and cash flow is reduced. It means that if someone is in particular hardship, having utilised this scheme, they can still make an application under the special payments policy. And we can then look and say, well, actually, all of their cases were of a higher band than the one we have paid. So we could safely pay additional funds to them to help them in the financial hardship that they get. So it gives us a way of dealing with things which continues to protect public money if there's a further hardship. Okay, no, that, that's been helpful. It's helped clarify issues for me. Um, Linda? That was, you know, most of it has been covered by the chair. I'm just, I suppose, trying to establish, so those who fall without this scheme, is, is, are they speaking to the economy minister, for example, about their particular circumstances? Because I know that, obviously, as a constituency MLA, I'm lobbying the economy minister on those who we would want to see caught in the hardship scheme. And has has this information from the bar went to the economy minister? Does as anybody aware? Can we establish that so, somehow to find out to make sure that if if they're not going to be paid out? in this scheme in a way that will allow them to continue to practice that at least that that's been looked at as part of the hardship scheme that the economy minister has said she's going to bring forward because we're we're highlighting a number of cases and I think that this could potentially be another one that should be highlighted if it's not going to be met by the the justice department um see that that last comment around if if they utilize this scheme they can still utilise the, the hardship scheme that's already there. Yes. What is the criteria for getting from that? You know, how, how difficult is it, I suppose, is what I'm... Well, it, 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 is, it is difficult, and that's why we are proposing a simple and easy-to-administer application scheme to allow a cash flow to go through firms, because in the, in the hardship scheme, uh, I think we would have to then be satisfied that there was sufficient work to cover the costs that they were looking to take from us. So we are assuming that in our interim payment scheme, that there's three months of work that is there, that we, are, we can safely pay funds, which would probably be perhaps slightly less than what they would have done to date. In the other side of things, if you're getting the hardship, they would have to identify cases and say, well, this is the work that I've done. It's significantly more than that. And it's more intrusive as a scheme because it is a scheme of last resort. 
so uh, to answer the first part of your question, to the best of my knowledge uh, and subject to correction from Eamon, we haven't shared this with the Minister of the Economy as you uh, queried. We can't do so, but we are saying that there is an internal mechanism here for legal aid practitioners uh, to deal with that. My, my practical observation is that in rural constituencies you know, there will be a mix of legal aid work and privately paying work that's going on, and as economic downturn means that perhaps people's financial circumstances have changed dramatically, they may not be taking forward the privately paying work that they previously would have done. That seems to be mm. the feedback that's coming uh, through the system at present. I, th I think it would be important because whatever, you know, no, we want the, one of the ministers, somebody somewhere to make sure that all of these people are still in business after this because we don't want the, but obviously there are going to be some people that won't make it through this and we understand that. But it is, at the end of the day, the responsibility of the Justice Minister to make sure that people have access to, to justice and to make sure that at the other side of this, that people are not struggling to get a barrister. We already have issues, we know, in the court process in terms of length of time it takes, and if we start having issues with people actually being able to get access to a barrister or a solicitor or to, to somebody to represent them, then that's not going to be good at the other side of this. We already have enough difficulties and we don't need to to create further difficulty. So I do think that the Minister has a responsibility to at least speak to the Economy Minister about if, if she is able to ensure that we have as many of these people still in business at the other side of this. Uh, happy to take that point forward. And I think, as I tried to make clear in the opening remarks, you know, a sustainable access to justice platform is, is vital mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, of the department. And the fact that we do have actually a good geographical spread of access points throughout the uh, jurisdiction is an important point which we want to, to maintain as far as that is possible. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Gordon? Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much for your presentation. Would well, it be fair to say that uh, quite a lot of the uh, legal profession are working from home at the moment? As far as I know, Law Society House and the Board Library are closed, and I suspect an awful lot of firms are, are, are fairly mothballed at present. Fairly mothballed, yeah. yeah. Now, I have been working with some of them, and I'm aware um, of the problems with the premises. Uh, getting access onto mm. existing schemes, they're not meeting the criteria, uh, especially the 25,000 one, they don't meet it. So, we are lobbying, and I'm on the Economy Committee, and we do have regular liaison with the Minister and her, her staff, so we are raising those issues with them, but it is a difficult one. Um, to get a payment, would you have to uh, have uh, a case on your system, or would you have to show evidence that you've been active okay. on, on the case? You know, is it not just a matter of being a case registered, or probably on your, your IT system? Are you going to get a payment for that, for example? Well. If I take you to the, uh, the scheme documentation, uh, if that would be of assistance, yeah. uh, we, we are in the tremendously uh, fortunate position of having uh, a digital online application <laughs> process, which uh, people kind of, you know, they don't yeah. need to be in their office, they can apply yeah. from their IT at home. Uh, we're also in the fortunate position as more laptops become available that I have more people processing payment at yes. home. Uh, just for your information, last month we processed 7.64 million of payments, and this month we are on target to do something very similar. Close of play yesterday, we had processed 6.9 million. Uh, just, I, I, make that, I make that point in testimony to staff who, in very difficult circumstances, are providing you know, an extremely high level of service. That's per month, sorry. Per month. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, under the scheme, uh, Someone has a legal aid certificate, it's on LAMS, they can therefore apply, and they just apply in the normal way. We are not looking for anything other than two things. The fact that this case is there, if it's a criminal case, we're looking for nothing else because the court has granted criminal legal aid, so we know that the case is uh, progressing. So that would be the condition met. For civil cases, because there are many civil cases which don't end up in court, they're settled in terms yeah. outside, we can't really look to the court system as a mechanism, but if there are court orders, we're simply looking for an uplift of a court order to prove that work is being done, or 
a simple letter which shows exchange between parties that work has been done. We're not trying to make this a difficulty. We're trying just to ensure that we are satisfied that not only is there a certificate, but that certificate has produced some level of activity. I, I would have to say it's a de minimis amount of evidence that we're looking for because the certificate guarantees a payment at some point anyway. So they've gone through an approval system? Yes. And it's been authorised. And so uh, they don't need to show any, any real evidence of having done work as such? It's just, it's just evidence that the case is a live case, yeah. effectively. In my terms, you say if the case is cancelled, what, what happens then? Will the payment be recovered? Well, it, it, I'll not make you an offender for a word, but that, that, that covers a range of scenarios. Yes. So, for example, what, what can happen in just normal business, as you will appreciate, that there could be a, a client who decides to move to another firm of mm -hmm. solicitors. Now, the system already deals with that on a day and daily basis. So the interim <coughs> payment scheme will deal with that just in the normal business side of things. The, the firm will produce a report saying, we no longer act for this person. We will process it, recognise that an interim payment has been made. The level of the interim payment probably means that there's no further action that's required. Okay. If, however, uh, you get to a slightly different scenario, uh, and, and this is something which I, I mentioned for a, a reason, Someone can have their legal aid certificate suspended and perhaps revoked if they do not continue to make contributions. So what we are saying to solicitors is, whatever you do, don't let your client get into that position. If a client cannot make their contributions because their financial circumstances have changed, come to us immediately. We will reassess it. It is likely that they, there's, their contributions will go down, or they may not have a contribution to make if they're now going on, on to the benefit system. But there's a number of messages that we're getting out to solicitors saying, look, we need to be proactive about this. We need to protect people's rights. You know, it's an easy thing to stop making a contribution because you think there's no consequence to it, but there can be. That could lead to the certificate being revoked, and then we would have to deal with the aftermath of that. But in principle, the level that the fees are currently pitched at, we do not think there is a significant exposure to the public purse because the amount of money that is being paid is likely to correspond to what they would be due, and we suspect additional payments might be due. But Evan, did you want to? Uh... Above that, though, the payments are pitched at the level that, they are, in reality, there will be a further payment at the end of the case. The end of the case, right. And it is significant that this affects about 43% of our solicitors out there. Uh, to be honest, I, I suspect it will affect you know, well into the 80% of the solicitors for those who have legal aid. I think the 43% that you're referring to are those who are saying that they're dependent on legal aid for over 80% of their income. Uh, yeah. But I, I suspect that the income flow from privately paying clients will have significantly reduced Right, yeah. So the dependence will be exaggerated in the yeah. current climate because legal aid is a, is, a, is a state benefit in that sense that guarantees payment if you have such a certificate. Right, OK. John, thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Duke Beatty. Uh, Chair, thank you. Paul's fascinating, I've got to say. And uh, I mean, when you delve into the judiciary, it can be extremely complicated, I've got to say, and I'm no subject matter expert, but access to justice is something that's incredibly important, uh, and we must need to make sure that it's there. Uh, and going through these extraordinary times, whatever we can do to help ease hardship on individuals, be they solicitors, barristers, or anybody else, then, then I think we need to step in and we should need to try and do that. So in, in broad principle, uh, you know, I'm absolutely in support of this, but, but just something that the chair said, and, and I think he's absolutely right, and it's worthwhile we need to put this on record, is that <coughs> this hardship is spread right across Northern Ireland and the wider United Kingdom and the wider world in many, in many ways. You know, when I, I reflect on, for example, taxi drivers, uh, taxi drivers who cannot drive any longer and they now have to wait for the... Uh, the, the self-employed income support scheme, which is not kicking in until June, uh, and they're they're having to, to make do, and there's nobody stepping up for them in many ways. And there's other people who, who are missing out in the same way. Um, 
but you're being very, very proactive and you're putting something in place. But I'm just looking at one of the under, under, underpinning principles that you have at 2.5, um, subparagraph A, uh, and it says that this scheme that you're putting in sits alongside other forms of relief. Yeah. Does that mean, in essence, then, that a solicitor and a barrister can avail of the scheme you're putting in, but can also apply to the self-employed income support scheme as well? Yes. And their firm can still apply for the 10K grant, or in some cases can still apply for the 25K grant scheme, and we don't know where that money is going to. So that solicitor or barrister could have a stream of income coming from three or four different directions. And I think that's the point I was trying to make to the Chair, Mr. Brady, that in essence, yes. Uh, to all of those things. I think I made the point to Mr Dunn that there is some evidence, but I, I, mm. I can't produce the evidence. Yeah. It's anecdotal to me at the present time. Mr Dunn may have had practical illustrations of it, whereby firms are not able to avail of that. Um, and what I would say in response to that is two things. First of all, I, I can only deal with firms that have legal aid cases, because that is the only firm I have a, a relationship with, and I can only deal with those cases from that firm that have legal aid. So there are other aspects of the work which are, are being done by firms out with legal aid, and I think we cannot make one scheme dependent on the other, because at mm -hmm. point of time A, a firm may not have got any of that assistance for whatever reason, uh, and we could be paying them out. And then, if we keep saying every time they make an application, where are you with your, your other applications? The whole thing does grind to something of an inglorious halt. And the very thing we're trying to do is maybe the thing that we all do. So I, I fully appreciate your point. We did think about could we link the schemes and thought that practically it's going to be so difficult uh, to do. But you, but you can see the point that I'm making. Oh, absolutely, well, I, I, absolutely. And, and it's and it's it's not your fault. It's yeah. not it's not their fault. I mean, you are being proactive and putting something in place. I think if you look at this in the wider scheme, that there will be people out there who are, who are saying not necessarily linked to the justice committee or anybody else saying, well, how long? Why are we not got schemes absolutely. put in place that covers us in exactly the same way? Because you're right. You know, a self-employed income support scheme which kicks off in June doesn't help you in March or April no. or May. No. You know, uh, and it won't help your members. So you know, and, and that's why I'm sort of just raising that just. So, so I'm absolutely, absolutely clear. Um, you know, I, you could never oppose it because it, no. you, you've got to help people who are, who are who are in difficulty. So, so I'm not opposing it. I just want clarity in, in regards to that. And can I just clarify something? I think I, I might have missed what Gordon was, was saying, but I, so it's just for me really um, within your sector. Is legal aid certificates still being issued even now? Yes. Online. So, so there could be a legal, a new, a new legal aid certificate issued today. Yes. And then the individual would then be entitled to this interim payment three months from today. Three, three months from today. Three months from today. Now, uh, again, Is that right? That's, that's absolutely okay. right. I was just going to make a, a, a sort of a, a candor point, uh, if I if I may. Um, what we have seen word. is uh, well, well uh, you, it's a, you, you've asked a question. Well, uh, I, I suspect there's a point to the question, and if I deal with, with that point, it may be of more assistance <laughs> to you. Um, what we have seen is a significant fall in the grant of legal aid. Uh, we took four weeks in November because there was no public holidays and we just treated that as a, a normal month. And then we took the 16th of March to the 10th of April as being the most recent point up to the Easter holidays. And during that period, we saw a 48% reduction in applications for legal aid. Um, and that included the grant of criminal legal aid by the courts and legal aid by ourselves. Now, I think there's a variety of reasons for that. Uh, you know, there's perhaps not the same contact with clients, and clients are maybe not seeking uh, advice uh, as they would have previously have done. But we are continuing to operate. We, we had the advantage of moving on to our digital system over the summer. So we effectively had a methodology of dealing with things offline, which we have continued. So any emergency certificate, I think the, there was a question uh, in a letter to the minister from the committee about was uh, judicial reviews being processed? Yes, if there's applications for them and there are emergencies, they are being processed. Domestic violence is another thing which there's a good uh, uh, 
flow of business in still, and they're being dealt with on the same day basis. And as we've got more people, we're then going into what we would call the normal work in progress, uh, and we're progressing those. So there will be uh, new cases which in three months' time will qualify under the scheme, but the point I'm trying to make uh, to you is the number of those are going down. Now, in future weeks, we might see a bit of a change to that, but I think that's one of the reasons for introducing the scheme at this point, because we know we've got probably about 23,000, 24,000 certificates at the minute that can qualify, but there will be a rundown okay. in future, future months of that of, that of assistance. It, it, it answers, Paul. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Doug. Um, Paul Frey. Yes, Chair, thank you very much. And I tried to follow that as best I could, and, and so I would ask for those pardon if I, if I ask a question that has already been answered or has already been explained in the opening remarks. But can I ask, so this is an interim payment. So it's not new money or a new payment. It's just an advance in what the, the special barrister would get anyway in normal circumstances. Is not that correct? Uh, absolutely, uh, Mr. Frew. And uh, from your experience on the Justice Committee, uh, you would know that if we were changing the remuneration rates, no one would have agreed to a five-day consultation period. So it, it effectively is simply a way of giving some uh, interim relief uh, and cash flow. I think, no doubt, you caught the Chair's point about the contingency aspect, and that was simply to recognise that some firms uh, may become bankrupt and then there will be an additional cost through uh, the bankruptcy of a firm. But as you appreciate, one of the things we're trying to avoid is any unnecessary bankruptcy from legal service providers. Yes. So it's also the case, too, that there's always a lag, uh, always a lag when it comes to applying for payment on this. So if I'm right in my understanding, solicitors could hold off applying for this money for a period of months and then basically uh, hand in their caps, if you like, and get money at any given time. So, so if that's correct, if my understanding is correct, then what, what I, what I, my spirit of my question would be, and I, I, let me paint a picture of a curve. So there's a curve of hardship for lack of work and money coming in for some solicitors and bosses, uh, some employed in firms. So they could actually lessen or flatten that curve of hardship uh, by the fact that they now could apply for all of that money that's outstanding now. And then whenever this is lifted, the crisis is over, work surely will ramp up again. Uh, and everyone in society hopefully will be very, very busy. And that wave of, of work Will, will make up maybe for the lean periods now, whether it be a month, three months, or whatever. So, is it not the case that solicitors and barristers may well have the agility to protect themselves from the worst excesses of hardship in the coming weeks? I thought you were going into the seven fat years and seven lean years there, Mr. Frew. Yes, yes. Uh, well, if I, if I take that principle, um, the, the way I would describe it, and I think we're describing the same thing, but in a slightly different way, I, I think what happens in practice is that legal firms that do legal aid work predominantly, they live today on work which they did two or three years ago. So there is a time lag, and you're quite right in that. The fundamental difficulty is that there are so few cases actually being disposed of that the, there has been a breach in what is the business cycle that they are used to. You go back to the time of the Crown Court strike, as you will recall from a previous yes. mandate, uh, and then you get a surge of cases that come through at a, at a later point in time. So there will, be, there will be an element of that, but I suspect the, the critical thing is when do we get to the point where something approaching more normal business is being resumed and how quickly cases are then able to be disposed of? 
My, my suspicion is that firms that can bill any work now are sending those bills into us. I, I, I said to Mr Beatty that the applications had gone down by 48%. If I look at the bills that we received over the same periods, they've gone down by 32%. But I suspect those figures will, that percentage will increase further uh, because there's so few additional cases being disposed of. So effectively, you're right, it's a timing issue. Uh, and we need to get people through to the point where they're able to build normally again and get a, a cycle of cash flow re-established. So would it be fair, let's look at the wider, the wider panoramic view then and, and the higher level, which we would have to concern ourselves with as a justice committee, the legal aid bill itself to society and to the rate pair. Uh, this should have no effect. If this is interim payment, an advanced payment, if you like, this should have no effect then on the legal aid bill and burden. Uh, if, if it does either negatively or positively, can you explain why that would be? Yes, I, I think the way I would describe it is that the money that I get for my budget allocation for 2021 will be the money that is used in the first instance to pay these interim payment bills and other bills that come in. Uh, the only point of difference that it makes is that it skews the time at which the uh, a part payment is made. Uh, the second point, just to uh, be absolutely clear, I cannot say that there is no possibility that there may not be an additional cost because if a significant number of firms do not survive the crisis, then there would be a transfer cost to another firm which would be um, incurred. I think that was the million pounds that the chair was alluding to at the outset. Uh, my, my point uh, in response to that, Mr. Frew, is that in reality, uh, that those firms would still be entitled to a payment anyway, uh, and we would have to, on a case-by-case -case basis, establish whether they're entitled to an enhanced payment than they received, or they owe us some money. And if they owe us some money, then we're just in the debt recovery scenario. Yes. Uh, you see, thank you very much for your, your answers, uh, and you have explained it very well for me. Uh, I'm a bit uh, on the same page as the Chair, and I'm certainly dog on this, whereby you know, we, access to justice is fundamentally important in any democracy, and it must be protected. But yet we don't have a taxi firm uh, interim payment. We don't have a Brickies uh, interim payment um, or a Sparks interim payment. So... We're treating, we're treating barristers and solicitors different here from others, yet they can still avail of all the schemes. And also, if there's going to be a mop-up scheme or a further hardship scheme or even a recovery scheme in the weeks ahead, there should be no reason why barristers and solicitors cannot avail of any of those. Um, so I think we need to be careful here and we need to monitor this so that there is an additional burden on the taxpayer and that one aspect of business or society is, is shielded and protected. Whilst we want to shield and protect everyone in society and business, that we don't let other people and aspects and sectors down of the society, of, of business and the economy. Uh, and, and so that's a moral question uh, going forward. But I, I thank you for your questions, uh, your answers here today. Thank you. Thank you, Good. Okay, members. Um, Rachel, I'm not sure if you're wanting to come in. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Um, my, uh, my, my phone cut out halfway through that, so apologies if my questions have already been asked. I do apologise. Um, I have just a few. I'm just wondering, is there a current interim payment scheme um, or is it special payments hardship scheme you mentioned earlier on, the, the other scheme that um, people can avail of? And if there is an interim payment scheme, how do these figures stack up in comparison? Okay, so I, I, I'm not sure whether you caught my opening remarks where I was making the point that in the vast majority of criminal cases and family cases in the lower courts, there is no interim payment scheme for day-to-day uh, -day, uh, profit costs. If the case, however, is before 
the high court or the county court in a civil scheme, there is a statutory provision for interim payments. What we have done is incorporated that scheme, that existing statutory scheme, within the remit of our interim payment scheme so that there's a consistency of approach. And we have adopted the historical rates for that uh, higher court civil interim payment scheme within this scheme and uh, used it as a benchmark. So what we're trying to do, if I can put it in simple terms, is make sure that every practitioner that does every sort of case is in a similar position to those few that will do high and uh, county court actions. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of your comments earlier on about the consultation that had been done with the bar and others on the matter, do you think that this is sufficient? Um, because I would like to hear a wee bit more from the providers before making decisions on this. And how are you intending on addressing the concerns raised already with yourselves by those respondents? Well, we received the responses on uh, Tuesday evening. Uh, I think Eamon and I have, have had a quick read through them. Some of them are uh, very detailed and very technical, and we'll have to go through them in slower time. Uh, if, I, if I may make a point, um, if everyone wants an interim payment scheme, the sooner there's an interim payment scheme uh, to enable people to survive, the better. Uh, and if the Law Society and Bar wish to make representations, they are, of course, at liberty to do so. Uh, I'm bringing the matter to the Minister, obviously, with the benefit of any views that the Committee uh, wish to offer. Uh, but I suspect we would like to move at pace at this, because uh, the longer we delay, the more likely that some firms or individual barristers could find themselves in particular difficulties. But I, I'm, I'm open to the, the views of the Committee on how it wishes to proceed. Okay, and just finally, in terms of the difference um, between if there is difference between payments for junior and senior counsel, has this been factored in in that a large number of junior counsel could be adversely affected by the fees outlined in the scheme in comparison to senior counsel? Has that been looked at? So I think the bar's comments are exactly the opposite, that the senior counsel are disadvantaged. Okay, but would, in general, would there not be more um, junior counsel dealing with legal aid yeah. than, than senior counsel? Getting exactly the same fee. It's our proposal. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, Rachel. Okay, members, unless there's any other questions, members want to raise. Um, Paul and Eamon, thank you very much um, for, for your presentation. Uh, consultation, um, it, it's finishing. It finished on Tuesday past. And your deliberations on the final level of fee, is that now currently that, still that's under what, consideration? In fact, that's exactly what we're going to after this meeting, Chair. Okay. Um, uh, obviously, members have all raised their points. Um, I've raised mine already and set kind of the context and, and flagged up some of the broader issues that I think need to be taken cognizance of. I take the point this is about the supply chain and government mm. you know, finding a mechanism to, to provide a way to make payments for that supply chain. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I distinguish that, I suppose, from the broader support packages that mm. are available. Um, and, and so it's on that basis um, that you know, I'd be content um, with, with, with where you're going in this, but obviously you need to take your final views on the proposals around uh, the level of fee that needs to be paid. Caveat that with, there is a mechanism to get that topped it, up. It, exactly. Um, and this is about the most effective means of getting something out yes. to allow people to continue. And, and therefore, I think there's a, a justification for the approach that the department's taken. But obviously, that's a matter for the department to, to try and uh, proceed. So uh, that's my own view okay. and, and that of my party in terms of the, the, the broader comment around that. That's not necessarily an official committee view. I'm happy to, to open it up to, to members if they want to elaborate any further, if they feel that that's necessary. No, other than to say, I think that, to be fair, 
if some of the other schemes had have been simplified, I think people would have appreciated it. The, the kinds of people that, that Doug and others have raised, the taxi drivers and, and those who are having to wait to June to get any kind of a payment. So I do understand the rationale for simplifying the, the issue. Um, and obviously there's no such thing as a perfect scheme, particularly not in these circumstances. I mean, we have seen where we have debated schemes for months and years and still they have not been perfect. So when you're bringing something in in this kind of a time scale, it's going to be anything but perfect but it, trying to get some money to some people to keep thing, things ticking over I think is, is probably mm. the only way we can move forward at at this stage so I, I think I would concur with the, what the, the chair is saying in terms of that we need to try and put the best possible um, scheme in place and, and take on board and obviously you've said you're going to read over what, what, yeah. what you know responses you've got back. So if something comes up in those responses that does highlight that there's going to be a real risk, I, I certainly would like you know, cognizance to be taken of that. But we'll have to get something out to people. And, and we'll share, of course, the, uh, the response to the consultee's document in the normal way so you can get a full visibility of that. Okay. Dig, are you you're content? No, I'm that, content, yeah. But, so if members are happy with that kind of general narrative of, of what I've articulated, what Linda has articulated, you know, there's no, there's no perfect game. It's not without its issues, and no doubt there'll be representation made, you know, um, but given the circumstances that we're in, it's a, a caveated mm -hmm. um, you know, understanding of what's trying to be proposed by the department, and it's certainly not an objection to proceeding. Thank you very much. Um, uh, can I thank the committee members as well for their questions? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, okay. Thank you okay. Thank you. Good. Okay. Thank you, members. Um, we'll try and progress through just the, the rest of the the committee committee schedule here of work just to, to get it done. Um, if you can bear with, bear with me. Um, domestic abuse and family proceedings bill. Second stage of the domestic abuse family proceedings bill scheduled for next Tuesday. And there's a copy of the Hansard of the oral evidence session with the officials on the bill has been included in the pack for members' ease of reference. At our meeting on the 30th of January, the committee agreed to commission a research paper on new or emerging approaches in other jurisdictions on tackling domestic violence and abuse, in particular uh, legislative related developments and the creation or use of other offences in addition to coercive control offences to assist with members' consideration of the bill. That research paper is now available and it can be found on, um, in your meeting pack. The research papers are normally placed on the Assembly website after they have been presented to the committee. So if members are agreed, we will publish the research paper on the website and that in future committee research papers would automatically be published on the website unless the committee would decide otherwise. Members content with that approach? Agreed. Um, the Department has provided a delegated powers memorandum relating to the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. It identifies the provisions in the bill which confer powers to make delegated legislation and outlines the reason for taking each power and the nature of it. Uh, to assist the committee's consideration of the delegated powers in the bill, normal practice is to forward uh, the memorandum to the examiner of statute reviews, uh, rules and seek her views on whether it's appropriate for each of the powers outlined in the memorandum to be left to subordinate legislation rather than included in the bill itself, and whether the choice of assembly control provided for each power, uh, i.e. those that are confirmatory, affirmative, negative or none, is the most appropriate. So if members are content, um, we will refer the delegated powers memorandum to the Assembly Examiner of Statutory Rules for a report highlighting any issues that the committee may wish to consider. Agreed? Agreed. <coughs> Item 6. Um, officials briefed the committee on proposals for an LCM for the private international law bill at our meeting on the 12th of March, subsequently provided further information regarding the delegated powers provision in the bill, including clarification of what role the committee would have. Um, should the Department consent be required by the Secretary of State to act on behalf of Northern Ireland to implement international agreements on private law, international law um, into domestic law in the future. In response, the Department advises that the Committee would be informed in advance of whether the Minister for Justice is inclined to provide or withhold consent and emphasise that any regulations made under the provisions would not entail significant policy changes but would simply state that a new international agreement has the force of law and make any requisite supporting procedural changes. 
uh, in line with the committee's agreement on the 2nd of April um, on the handling arrangements for a range of work items in light of current exceptional circumstances. A number of papers <coughs> relating to the proposed LCM um, were issued to members on the 10th of April, including uh, the <coughs> DOJ response and an update on the position in the Scottish Parliament and Welsh Assembly. No questions or requests for further information or clarity were received from members for onward submission to the Department. The Minister um, has laid the LCM on the 20th of April in accordance with Standing Order 42A7. The Committee now has up to 15 working days to consider and report on the LCM. So, members, I haven't taken you through that. It's just uh, to uh, seek whether you're content with the proposal to extend these provisions to implement the three Hague Conventions in domestic law and create the power to implement future um, PIL international agreements in domestic law via secondary legislation on private international law uh, to Northern Ireland by way of an LCM, or whether any further information or clarity is required. Are members content that we would proceed um, with the extension of these provisions? Agreed. Agreed. Item 7. At our meeting on the 2nd of April, the Committee considered and agreed handling arrangements for a range of work items in light of the current circumstances. In respect of the LCM on sentencing bill, the Committee agreed to consider written briefing papers, submit any questions um, for further information or clarity to the Department. Depending on the issues raised and the timing of the LCM, consideration would then be given to an oral briefing if that was required. The relevant papers were circulated to members on the 7th of April. No questions or requests for further information or clarity were sought for members to submit to DOJ. The Department has advised that it expects to lay the LCM next week. The 15-day timescale then provided for by standing orders will then start. Therefore, a decision on whether an oral briefing or any further information is needed to scrutinise the LCM uh, would be required at this meeting. So, members, if you're content that no further information is required and therefore an oral briefing isn't necessary, um, then we can proceed unless you feel that you need an oral briefing. Okay, then we're content to proceed without the need for an oral briefing. When the LCM is led, we'll reschedule it onto the agenda. Okay, Thank you, Christine. Item 8 is the Counterterrorism Bill. Uh, the Minister for Justice provided the Committee with an update on counterterrorism and uh, the Counterterrorism Bill, sorry, and a summary of that position on key issues uh, recently discussed with the Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice. Officials continue to engage extensively with the Minister for Justice um, to ensure that legislation can appropriately be implemented in Northern Ireland, providing a detailed briefing to the Committee on legislative provisions at the earliest opportunity. So, members, that information is there for uh, noting, unless any more clarity is required at this time. We agree to note. Noted. Agreed. Item 8 is the Department for Justice budget. Um, papers uh, have been provided. At our meeting on the 2nd of April, the Committee agreed that given current circumstances, it is not appropriate to proceed with oral evidence session on the budget that had been scheduled for this meeting. Members instead agreed to consider uh, the written information. Um, papers, including information provided by the Department on the 2021 budget, were issued on the 10th of April, requesting that members forward questions that they may have by noon yesterday. Uh, since those papers were issued, the Committee for Finance circulated two papers from the Department of Finance providing information on allocation of COVID-19 resources, additional resources that were not included in the budget that had been announced on the 31st of March. These additional papers were included in the meeting pack along with written evidence from Dr Esmond Burney to the House of Commons Northern Ireland Affairs Committee on New Decade New Approach, supporting committees in their consideration of the budget. Um, there is a list of questions at pages 12 to 15 of your table pack that uh, members had submitted. Um, these have been compiled. Um, and the relevant scrutiny points from the raised paper and also from uh, our committee staff. Um, there are two further additional uh, questions, members, that I just uh, want to include. That is that the urgency with which COVID-19 resources are required and the level of confidence in the Department that its requirements will be met, and also how much funding that the Department uh, will provide to take forward problem-solving justice initiatives during the 2021 financial year and what initiatives will be funded. So if you're content, we'll add those two further um, questions okay. to the list. Um, Linda? Um, just a, a quick one. There's a, there's a good scope of questions there, so I think most things are covered. But just one of the things that I would like to know is, 
obviously there will be money that will not be able to be spent on programmes that were intended within the, the Justice Committee and I'd like a bit of detail, Have has that scope and exercise been done to see where money will not be spent rather than just continually going to, you know, can, can that money be used for the COVID, some of the COVID issues for example, rather than just going to the Finance Minister continuously looking for more money because what's going to end up happening is money being returned mm -hmm. because it hasn't been spent and, and those things have not been looked at. Um, properly, so I mean, it quite possibly is the case that that's already happening. But I would like some reassurance that mm. it is happening and that mm. it, there's not a continuous, without looking at what's not going to be able to be done and where those savings can be made. Yeah. Just going straight to the finance minister and saying we need more money for this. Yeah. No, I, it, it's a very valid point. So uh, I think we should be asking what what work has been done to identify potential capital and resource that under normal circumstances would be spent but potentially as a result of these circumstances um, they're unlikely to be able to have a, a delivery program um, that would be applied and I agree uh, much better that that is identified early so that the uh, Department for Finance are able to allocate that to where there is other pressing need that, that we need to support so i um, happy to include that as a, as a question. Apologies for not having that in, by the way, I should have, but oh, it's been okay. a bit of a busy few weeks. <laughs> that's right. yeah, that's an understatement. <laughs> okay, members. Um, okay, the response then will be circulated as soon as we receive it on a committee position on the budget discussed and agreed at our meeting that will hold on the 30th of April. Um, item 10 then. Um, at our meeting on the 27th of February, committee considered a proposal for a stat rule that would be subject to negative resolution procedure, updating the list of police stations across Northern Ireland where convicted sex offenders can attend to notify the police of their personal details. The list will be updated to remove a number of police stations that are no longer open to the public and provide details of the opening hours of police stations on the list. The committee requested further information on the current list of prescribed police stations and the reasons for not including some operational police stations on the list. The Department has responded, advising that the police has indicated that the demand for sex offender registrations can be adequately managed within the new suggested list of prescribed stations and it's not felt necessary to increase the proposed number and locations of prescribed police stations at this time. The response also highlights that the proposed stat rule removes three police stations, Andrum Road, Belfast, Ballymoney and Ballycastle from the current list, which has been at the request of the police service. So if members are content with that information, then we can indicate that we're content with the stat rule. Members agreed? Agreed. Okay. Chair, Chair, can I just ask, yes, Paul. Does, the given, does they outline the reason why they don't think they're operationally required? In terms of the the specific responses from the police service, yeah, uh, they've omitted. I think it was you said three police stations there: Antrim Road, Ballin Money, and I didn't catch the third one. But Bally Castle, Bally Castle. So there, straight away, you have two police stations in a certain constituency. Now, again, again, I know this isn't constituency based, but it, I just wonder. Uh, you know, it, I don't think it's good enough to give the committee an explanation as to say we don't think they're operationally required. I think we need to know why they're not operationally required. Um, I get a wee bit more greater insight. I'm not saying for one moment to hold up the the, uh, the procedure here at all, but I, I think I need more understanding as to why they're not operationally required. Yeah. Sorry, Paul, we can clarify, we can write back to the department and clarify that. I think initially they had suggested that so they, were, they were reviewing the list to make sure or to take off non-operational police stations because some had been closed recently, but I'm not sure that applies to those three. But um, if you're content and the committee's content, we can write back and seek further clarification on that point. Yes, please. Okay. Um, What's the time frame, just sorry, Christine, in terms of um, the stat well, rule? Well, I think they were hoping to have the stat rule through by June, but I mean, if the committee's content, you can approve the stat rule and still seek the further information. If Paul, you don't feel that you need to hold up the decision. No, okay. see, to be fair, the police will do, operationally, the police will do what they think is right, anyway. Uh, so 
I, I'm happy enough to let things go and, and flow the way they are, but I just think I need more understanding of, of why they have excluded some police stations that are still operational. Like, I, no, I get, I get why you would take lists you take police stations that have closed off the list, why would you keep them on? But there are still some modern operational facilities there, and I'm just wondering why they, w- they wouldn't be used, but, but, but others are. Okay, well, if we're content, then we, we will approve the stat rule, but we'll seek to get that information to provide the, the rationale for those three police stations, if you're happy, Paul. Well, content, sorry, happy's not maybe yeah, the best. Yeah, one. certainly. Okay. Okay, thank you. Item 11 then. At our meeting on the 12th of March, the committee considered information provided by the department on a two-month consultation intended uh, to, uh, it was going to undertake on a proposed pilot scheme to enable solicitors to instruct psychiatrists and psychologists in public law proceedings in the family law proceedings courts within fixed hourly rates and with a cap on hours without the need for priority prior authority from the legal service agency to assist its consideration the, of the proposals committee requested further information on a range of issues the committee also advised the department that it was concerned about the length of time that it would take for final measures to be implemented given the northern ireland audit office and public accounts committee recommendations to address their divergence in the early rates allowed for the same expert type in civil cases and between civil and criminal cases Uh, that were made in 2016. The Department has provided that information on why a consultation on the pilot scheme is necessary, on why the Legal Services Agency cannot provide robust cost data in relation to expert witnesses, and how the estimated savings of £16,000 for the pilot project were reached, and how the cap on hours was decided. Um, The Department will provide a post-consultation report and final proposals to the Committee for consideration before introducing the pilot, which will run for a year, and inform development of hourly rates for all expert types in all cases. So, Members, it's uh, seeking just that you're content to consider the pilot scheme further when the results of the consultation and details of final proposals are available, if you're content. Great. Okay, correspondence. Um, there's items, 12 items of correspondence uh, in the meeting pack. Um, I'll draw attention to a number of them, and then obviously, if members want to raise others, feel free to do so. Uh, item one: the Minister for Justice and the Policing Board um, setting out the action being taken in response to recommendations of the Audit Office report on injury on duty schemes for officers in the police service and prison service. The department has established and leads a strategic group and action plan that will be uh, developed, setting out how the recommendations in the report will be addressed. In relation to the police service scheme, this will include consideration of possible amendments to current legislation. The Department of Finance is also considering legislative changes to the Civil Service Injury Benefit Scheme, which covers injury on duty payments for members of the Northern Ireland Prison Service. So, members, it's there to note the current position and to seek agreement to request a copy of the action plan when it's available, if members are agreed. 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 Item three uh, is of correspondence. There is a response from the Department setting out additional information uh, officials undertook to provide during the overview briefing on Safer Communities Directorate. The research report of the Santa Marta Group has been delayed from late spring, early summer, due to the ongoing circumstances, and it's now unlikely to be published before October. Uh, so, members, it's to seek your views on whether the briefing on human trafficking and modern slavery that the committee agreed to schedule should be arranged in the meantime, or whether you wish to wait until the research report is available. Uh, I think Patsy was maybe the one that was raising this. Yes. Um, so, if members are content, we'll, we'll speak to Patsy just about that and, and bring it back to yeah. the next meeting of the committee. I am content to, to wait for the report, but um, to be fair to Patsy, he's been the one that's been um, asking for this. So if, if members are content, the clerk will, will speak to, to Patsy and, and get a view from him on that, and we'll bring it back for, for the next meeting. Great. Item four is a response from the Department on implications for the police service in terms of Bear Scotland and Fulton and uh, uh, other cases cases where consideration is being given to legislation to limit the impact of retrospection. Um, the, the Department had indicated that England, Wales and Scotland introduced legislation in 
early 2015 to limit retrospection, but a similar amendment was not introduced in Northern Ireland. Policy and legislation uh, relating to employment rights is a responsibility for the Department of Economy, and the Minister has no plans to introduce associated legislation at this point. Um, so if members are content, we will write to the Department for Economy requesting uh, an update on the progress of the working group to examine the financial and practical consequences of the issues and why similar legislation to that in England, Wales and Scotland hasn't been introduced or wasn't introduced in 2015. Members content? Great. Great. Okay. There's correspondence with a response from the Department to Committee's request for a more definitive timescale for consideration of amendments proposed by BAC. BASC to Firearms Order 2004 in relation to the one-off uh, one uh, system. The Department has indicated that the Police Service has concerns around the current operation of the scheme and has outlined a time frame for a PSNI operational review by the end of 2020 and a departmental policy review and legislative changes by autumn 2021. If members are content, we will forward this response to BAC, BASC for information and propose that the committee requests further details of the police services concern around the current system that we could then consider in due course. Members content? Uh, there's also um, a letter that's been in the table pack from, from Basque in respect of the PSNI Firearms Explosives Branch raising issues regarding advice that's been sent to firearms dealers on the 9th of April, stating that they should not provide customers with dealer notes at this time. It's just to get members' agreement that we would forward this correspondence to the Department for information and comment and ask the Police Service to provide that response to Basque on the issues uh, being raised. If members are content. Really? Members content to action the other items um, as set out in the cover sheet. Or if you have any other comments on it, feel free to do so now, but otherwise we'll action it as outlined. Agreed. 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 Yeah. Chair, Chair, just on, just on that, that original BAS, BACSC uh, correspondence from the uh, department. I, I know that you've already actioned this, which is fine, uh, but I would be very interested to see what concerns they do have. Uh, someone, I know Patsy will be very keen to hear that also um, we were the members that brought this legislation forward. So I think it's very important that the PSNI engage with us all as a committee to see what concerns they have and how then they can be ironed out if need be. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Okay, thank you, Paul. I've, I've uh, no further chairman's business. Is there any other business um, members wish to raise? No. No, thanks. Okay, well, we, we will seek to organise this meeting um, for next week with the, the Minister for Justice um, and do that as soon as possible. So it may not necessarily be Thursday. Um, we have the domestic abuse in the Assembly on Tuesday. So it's unlikely that we, we could do it on Tuesday, but it may well be that we're able to facilitate it on Wednesday. I know that's the preferred day that um, the Chair's Liaison Group has indicated to committees to try and, and hold uh, meetings, but um, if, it, if it can be accommodated on Wednesday, we'll, we'll seek to do that. Otherwise, it may well be Thursday. But the Economy Committee, I think, is meeting on Wednesday. I understand that. Whatever. We could live with it or without it. That, that meeting will be purely around COVID-19 related issues. Obviously today there's been quite a lot of business that has been building up that we needed to, to deal with. Um, so next week we, we will deal with the Minister uh, in respect of that. Uh, I'm keen that it's the Minister that answers because we've had responses from the Head of the Prison Service and also ACC Todd. I think it's time that the Minister came and, and answered on behalf of the uh, Department for Justice. Uh, I'm not opposed to, to her bringing uh, either of those two individuals um, or, or other officials as she deems necessary, but I think we do need to have ministerial accountability, and I would expect the Minister uh, to be here for that meeting as well. Okay, well, I'll notify members as soon as we, we have the arrangements in place, and thank you very much for, for coming today. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.